On this video, you're going to see the world chess champion Magnus Carlsen face his challenger for the title, Fabiano Caruana. And if you're interested in Rook and Pawn end games, then check this out. It's fascinating and I think very instructive. So here we go. Fabiano Caruana won the candidates tournament in Berlin on Tuesday. And on the Saturday, he faced world champion Magnus Carlsen in the first round of the Grenker Chess Classic in Karlsruhe in Western Germany. Now, it's an incredibly strong tournament and it's just kind of by chance that these two are f face each other in the first round. Um, but of course, all eyes on this encounter. It, for the world title, it means nothing. But of course, if one of them can do well, then it gives them a psychological edge. So without further ado, Fabiano Caruana with the white pieces and he played d4, which, um, yeah, he, he played a few times in the candidates tournament in Berlin. And I mean, usually I think of him as an e4 player, but it's interesting he switched back to this and he played this move, e3, looks very modest. Um, but it's a system, again, that he used in the candidates tournament. And if you remember there, Grishuk played c5 and it went into a kind of Benoni. But after eight minutes thought, interesting, seems like Carlson was kind of making things up on the spot. Carlson played d6. And so we have a kind of King's Indian position. And knight c6 is a very provocative move. Of course, black wishes to play e5 staking a claim in the center, but it provokes white into pushing with d5. Now, the knight has to move, but in plain d5, of course, the bishop has more scope on the long diagonal. Now knight b4, and now Caruana played a3. I'm slightly surprised about that. I think it's better to castle and just play e4 here. And it takes time for that knight to bounce around to this excellent c5 square from where it puts pressure on the e4 pawn. Caruana played a3, pushing the knight back, but actually with the knight coming to c5, in, in a sense, black has gained time. That's really where Carlson wants to put it. Of course, it's not really possible to play b4 here because that exposes the long diagonal. And here one could, one could uh, even just take here straight away. Um, and and win material. So knight d4, I mean, looks very nice, but black now plays e5. And moving the knight again doesn't look very good. Um, if you put the knight back here, knight c5, there you go, that shows you how useful that knight is. And can already um, perhaps come into that b3 square. So Caravana took but of course, giving up that big pawn on d5 means that white loses some control in the center, loses his space advantage. And Carlson immediately took advantage of that by playing e5, pushing the knight backwards. And here I think knight f3 is actually the, the simplest way for white to play, followed by advancing b4 and bishop b2 just to straighten out the development. I don't think black is in any way worse here, but it seems to me that white also has a comfortable position. But knight b3 feels a bit odd to me. The knight, I don't think he's on a brilliant square on the queen side. It's a long, long way from protecting the king. Uh, blocks the b-pawn as well. So c6, and here you could still straighten things out by playing knight d2 and b4, but Caruana, after half an hour's thought, went for e4. Now that looks seemingly natural uh, to stake a claim in the center, but it exposes these two squares. And immediately, Carlson seized the opportunity to play this knight here. And here's the big idea, that this knight wants to come in to the square d4, possibly playing c5 first. Um, so if Caruana wanted to, he could trade and bring his bishop here, but you can see that this knight has options to fly in here. So for example, here, and you know, this is an excellent square. And I think already black has the, the much easier position to play here. 
Look, just compare that knight on b3 with the knight on f4. That knight on b3 very poorly placed. So back to this position. Instead, Caruana, well, he'd obviously, you know, thought about this in advance before he played f4. He played f5, a very aggressive move indeed. And Carlson threw the knight into d4. Now, if that's taken, then you can see all these dark squares are weak, not just on this diagonal, so discovered attack hitting the queen, but this diagonal as well. This is the problem when you advance your f-pawn. I often recommend to my students that they should glue their f-pawn to the f2 square uh, because it can create serious weaknesses. And here, for example, when the queen retreats, then queen b6 check immediately exploits that, followed by a knight f2 check. Here, well, you could play bishop d3 to hold that pawn on f5, and this is a very double-edged position. Um, but as I said, you know, advancing the f-pawn can actually rebound against you. Here's another little tactic. What about g4, which is the move? Well, if you're going to play in this way, of course, it would be lovely to be able to support the pawn on f5 and get these pawns going. But after knight takes bishop, then queen b6, there you go. Weakness of that diagonal, again, check. And the queen takes the knight. That unhappy knight on the queen side. So bishop b3 by Caruana. Now, if c5, which looks pretty wonderful protecting that knight, then what? White can at least get in that move g4, and this is simply a very double-edged position. But instead, Carlson played knight takes bishop, traded on f5, and now here's the point. Before White has a chance to bring rooks into the middle, he breaks with d5, and this is a problem. Those pawns in the centre potentially backed by two bishops. At the moment, difficult to get this one in the game, but, well, black's pieces, apart from that, looking good. The question is, can white exploit his lead in development to try and stymie those pawns in some way? But in fact, the pawns are safe. Here's an interesting moment. If Caruana had wanted to kind of hit um, the, the random button and just keep the initiative. He could have given up a piece here with a check and then taking on this pawn on d4. Now he's a piece down, but he has two pawns. Objectively should be nice for black, but black still has to develop his pieces here. So it's not so clear. Um, it's kind of a decision you'd make in a blitz game without any hesitation, actually. But Caruana obviously felt that his position wasn't so bad that he didn't need to do that. But watch what happens. So obviously there's a pin here. Pawn takes knight, rook takes queen. So queen moves and now this is a big threat. So a check. And then knight a4 pushing the queen away. Um, yeah, first glance I thought you know maybe knight d5 here to, to try and remove this blockade but actually after knight takes then simply bishop d7 and black has enough time to bring this bishop into play and the queen's rook and actually black is doing absolutely fine in this position well more than fine so it's very pleasant indeed once those center pawns get support in combination with the two bishops, then this is tremendous for black. So knight a4. Carlson happy to trade queens. If the queen drops back here, then b6. Now just look at those miserable minor pieces at the side of the board, and this bishop is about to fly into play. Not a good position. So Caruana traded queens and brought his knight back into the game, and now b6. Difficult decision for white here. He's getting pushed all over the place. You know, you can hop in here, but 
Already, this is tremendous for black. Knight comes to d5, won't be long before the rook joins the game, and you can see those pawns just hold the center, and white can't challenge them. So, bishop takes knight. Now, Carlsen has a really, really pleasant choice here. He could play simply bishop takes. Now, this is Caruana's hope that he's blockading with the knight, but even here, this is actually a very pleasant position for black. You're going to play bishop b7 and you know, maybe rook in as well. But instead he went for pawn takes knight instead. Um, also a very pleasant option for black. And now he has three pawns in the center. So finally this knight comes back into play, hoping to blockade on one of these squares. But well, you can see that bishop on the long diagonal is absolutely superb. F6 check, that's a bit of a randomizer. If the king, I mean, you know, king F7 looks like a, such a, a natural move to blockade the pawn and possibly bring the king to E6. But Carlson's judgment was superb because he appreciated that, for example, in this position, let's, let's play king E6. In fact, there are lots of chances for white in this position. Uh, you know, maybe playing f7, giving that up and, and throwing in a knight d6 check, maybe rook here sometimes as well. White has counterplayed there. He, he judged this very well and he played king f8, which avoids tactics. And now basically these pawns are threatening to roll down the board. So if rook f5, then simply e4, and this is absolutely terrible. So something like this, you can just start to give up material and the pawns are rolling through deadly. So Caruana blockaded on e4. And once again, Carlson realized that trying to control that knight was a hassle, so he just eliminated it and started rolling. So his play is absolutely straightforward, very direct indeed. Now, if this king were over here to blockade those pawns, then white would be in the game. But with the king so far away, this is extremely difficult. Caruana not, didn't have a lot of time um, to add to his problems, but watch what happens now. We get a very strange situation where Carlson has these two pawns steaming down the board. Um, that's taken, of course, the pawn pushes through. And now here's a funny situation, rook h8. And suddenly Carlson has to be careful. If you play king g6, this would be a disaster. You know, here's, here's a nice move. Check. And for example, if king h6, rook f5, and there's gonna be a mate on h5, terrible. But Carlson had this under control and he played the rook back. That's just to protect this rook before pushing on. So rook takes pawn check. So Caruana gets a pawn, but now the situation to some extent has cleared with those pawns ready to roll. Now, the king comes over just in time to stop those pawns. One tempo, just the tempo in it. So threatening to take here, so rook d7, and the king of course has to blockade, and king takes pawn. So, they've reached the time control at move 40, we're on move 43 now. Um, and the players have time to reflect and see where they've got to. Material is still even, but of course, with these further advanced pawns, then black obviously is better. Now, is it a win or is it a draw? Let's have a look. So white needs counterplay. Caruana played h4. King e5 from Carlson, so he wants to lend the, the pawn support and rook f1. That's an important move. If white just pushes these pawns, for example here, then just rook f7, and that is an absolute killer. This check coming, and then the pawns will just roll through. So this move 
rook f1 is incredibly important. And white pushes with h5. So now it's getting pretty critical. And here Carlson played rook e7. And it's at this moment that he missed the first of his wins. Maybe you'd like to um, take your time and examine this position and think how you would play here. And I, I think this next move is really instructive. It's absolutely fascinating. Of course, I think trying to find these ideas at the board is very, very difficult. Um, this is so complex, but it is very instructive. Carlson played rook e7. He should have played rook h7. Helps when you've got a computer analyzing this position, I can tell you. And it's it spits out rook h7. Okay, so why is rook h7 import, an important move? Well, basically, it's to stop these pawns advancing. I know that sounds a bit trite. I mean, normally such a passive move as this would be far too slow. But here, incredibly, white really can't do anything at all to improve his position. And black's basic plan here is to bring the king in, take that pawn, leave the king roughly here and advance the a-pawn. Um, and white really can't do much about that. So let me show you a couple of sample variations, typical variations. So one thing is, what happens if white tries to support his pawn here and push the g-pawn? Well, we've seen this just a moment ago. The rook comes to f7 and rook f2 and it's all over. Or if the rook comes here, then that's pretty bad as well, getting a new queen. So in, in that sense, white is already very restricted. And of course, if the king comes back, then black's king just moves in. So rook f4 check, let's, let's push the king back, fine. The problem is that now black has a very clear threat to, to bring the rook in once the, the rook is away from the first rank. Um, so for example, king here, rook b7 and, and rook b1 wins immediately. So, all right, well, let's see what happens. What if white simply waits with rook f3? Well, then we're going to bring the king in as advertised. And the king comes in. And well, if the rook goes backwards, we're just going to take on a3. So let's try rook b4 check. And at least activate the rook, putting the rook behind the pawn. And to some extent, cutting the king. Okay, we'll play king here. And now a5. So this is the basic plan we're just going to advance that pawn. And because the rook stands on h7, it's very difficult for white to get any counterplay at all. OK, so let's let's give some checks and see if that does anything. Now, if the rook goes to a8, then this move actually wins without any difficulty. So the rook has to stay. Whoops, sorry about that. White's rook has to stay behind the pawn. A4. Now, if the rook waits on the C file, then the rook comes over and the king comes in. So you can see that the rook is shielding the king here. So no rook, rook B6 check. Now, these look, pawns look pretty scary, but pawn A3. And basically, black gets there in time. Black queens first. That is absolutely crucial, of course. You, you get in the first check. And in these kind of situations, if you get in the first check, then it is fatal for the king. And if the king takes the pawn, then, well, let's say rook here, and the, the king will be checked to bits. And if king f3, well, many ways to win. But, I mean, d2 is, is a very amusing move because... In fact, the king here is beautifully covered. The queen and rook can't attack. And then we're going to play d1 and get another queen. And that really is the end of the show. Right, let's go back. Um, 
let's go back to this position. So that was just waiting there. So what about king takes pawn? Okay, now this is interesting. King comes in. Now, of course, if rook takes pawn, then you can simply give a check and, and win the rook. And if rook b8, then king c1. And this also wins because the a pawn is just going to roll through. And you threaten king d1 and c1. Okay, let's try another move. So coming back to this position. Okay, let's try rook f5 check. King comes in. And in this case, okay, we'll put the rook back on f1 and we'll we'll try and play more actively with white in a sense. We'll take on d3 and then bring the king over to try and support those pawns. Okay, well, first of all, white tries to gain a little bit of time by pinning here. And now the rook comes down. That's going to shield the king, but also bring the rook behind the pawns. And those pawns look incredibly dangerous. And this looks really slow for black, but just watch what happens. Okay, so c1 queen is threatened. So white finally has to take that pawn. And now a very important move, you put the pawn, we put the rook behind the furthest advanced pawn, so g6, and that pawn can just be taken. King f5. Now the king just comes over and basically black is absolutely fine here. Well, black is just winning. So for example, if king g6, you bring the king, and this is just winning. King g5, you take the pawns. Or let's say king f6. And here, well, rook g1, and again, you take the pawns. So this is complicated, but basically the move is rook h7. That's the winning move. And, and it just slows those pawns down. It stops them advancing for the moment and means that the king can carry on with its plan over here. Instead, Carlson played rook e7 with a threat, but the king is checked away. And rook f1, so that the threat is just to take the pawn. So Carlson brought his king over in a moment, <laughs> after repeating a couple of times. To the queen side. So this is very similar to the lines we were just looking at, but there is a difference. In fact, rook h7 is still winning in this position with exactly the same idea as I said before, that it just slows down that pawns. But I, th I think that's a very difficult move to spot because generally in endgames, you know, instinctively we don't play such kind of passive moves. Instead Carlson played a5, probably just thought it's just a draw, and after h6 he gave a check and stuck the rook behind the pawns. Now it's too slow basically. So this is the basic threat and yeah worse for black the king is on the wrong end of a check so basically Carlson here had to force a draw like this and so here they agree to draw so I mean a fantastic struggle and Carlson same came so close to winning that game so um, if you want to see their uh, a playlist of their previous encounters then do check out the uh, info tab and you can click through to that playlist and do check out that video description where you'll see lots of other playlists as well and don't forget to like comment share and subscribe and well does this game change your opinion about who might win the world championship in november fascinating first struggle between them thanks very much for watching